Okay, hopefully that is audible. I see that's coming out of the wrong device. Linux desktop audio. Okay, I think that that's working and the volume level's okay, it sounds like. Alrighty. Okay, so uh, my plan is to pick up where I left off last time and that was, I think I made a folder called New Voxel Project and I worked a bit on it last night, just tidying it up a bit so that if I have it open like this, I change the color a bit, if I have it open and then resize it, it will actually reallocate the image memory for that. Um, so that it all still holds the correct crisp uh, look to it. <clears throat> and then I can type stuff in and um, I've got some commands and if I type in list vars I should have a wireframe thing, I have auto-completion working, uh, backspace works, I added another feature into the console library last night as well. I've already forgotten what that was. Um, I'm sure it was very important. Um, oh, it's the up key, so I can quickly repeat the last command. Um, that's about it. And if I wanted to, I could press up several times to scroll through history, but I didn't implement that in the voxel project. It is there in the console library. Um, if that's actually useful f to people, um, it is a little drop-in two-file library, or four files, because it includes the font library as well, which is, you don't need any assets, you don't need shaders or anything, it all just works. Um, all it does, though, is create a big image, and you tell it how big the image should be, um, so that it will actually work in non-3D graphics stuff, it'll work in 2D as well, um, and it has some functions for, you will have to go away and work out the keyboard input, and then if you press tab, detect that the keyboard's press tab, you will tell the um, console library that, hey, auto-complete stuff. Um, so it doesn't know about the keyboard, it doesn't know about the graphics API, it just knows how to make an image. It doesn't actually read fonts, it's all uh, hard-coded font stuff. Um, the downside to it, though, is that it will recreate the whole image every single time that you update anything. So if I hold down a key, um, you see there's a frame counter up the top there, it's like very high at the moment. For some reason drawing the console at all is slowing it down quite a lot, um, but if I hold down a key, um, it will slow down immensely. And the reason for that, it is regenerating every pixel in this image every time it needs to update. So if I draw one character, it is going to work out every pixel again. So it's not optimized, that probably doesn't matter much. For a console where you're doing debugging commands, you don't usually care if you're slowing your game down, but it bothers me a little bit. So um, I would, ideally, all you do is update the section of your image that you're actually working on. Um, so if you're typing stuff in, ideally just that bottom line part of the image gets updated. And if you hit enter and it needs to add more text to the history back there, 
you could just move the whole existing image up one line and add your line in there. So that would be kind of nice. <clears throat> but I haven't done that. Um, I don't know if that's a today thing, but it, it kind of is in the background gnawing away at me a little bit. Uh, what I would like to do though today is animate the opening and the closing of the console. Um, I think it would be nice if it like Quake. I have no better reason than Quake did it, and it was cool when Quake did it, um, that it slides in and slides out. So I'm going to add a timer and an animation to it. I already have, I think, a variable for setting the position of it on the screen when I draw, and I think I have some stupid coordinate system for that where it's not at all what I expected it to be, um, but that should be pretty easy to get working. Just gonna open the text editor. Okay, I think I have that at a reasonable size. On size, okay. Um, I think I already set that up. Hello, game dev Kev. Um, I'm just continuing on from last time, and I just want to animate my console so it looks cool. Um, so what I need to do is when I draw the console, and I think it's like APGC for console library, and then draw. Um, no, that's not it. That's creating the image memory. That's a slow bit. Um, it's when I draw the texture. So it has this thing here. So draw a textured quad. That's the bit. Okay, so what I want is a timer. And if I have switched the mode from closed to open, I want to start a timer that helps set the position so it slides in. Um, I think I put all my console variables up here somewhere. So I'm just going to group it with these. I don't know where they'll go eventually, but this will do for now. Um, console, what am I going to call this? opening timer in seconds. Um, and I think I had like C open. Yeah. So if the console is not open, um, I think I had another section where it looked for the console input key. So, okay, this is the point where the state switches from open and not open and so on. So I'm going to say, uh, if C open, so it's just started opening, then opening timer, you know what, I'm actually going to make this a countdown, so opening countdown, I think is a better name. And how long do I want? I'm just going to default it to like one second and then we'll fiddle with it. Uh, okay, so I've already forgotten where it was drawing that thing, but if I look for C texture. Oh, it's right below me, okay. So in here I set the position and I'm just gonna modify the Y value based on this countdown. Um, so I'm gonna say if countdown is greater than zero, countdown minus equals and I think somewhere I already have seconds elapsed per frame up the top of the frame loop um, it's called elapsed underscore s um, and I probably want to clamp that back to zero but I don't really care um, do I maybe I do so equals I think I have a function called clamp or macro, so okay. And oops, I want that to be between 0, 0.0 and I don't know. Uh, I could just use max, right? I don't need clamp. Okay, so these are little macros I made that are just kind of handy. Um, 
that I already have set up. So basically what I'm doing is saying, okay, the countdown. So I know at the moment it's always going to be between zero and one. Um, so you know what I can do is actually set the position because I know it's always note uh, if So I'm just going to say minus countdown. So when it starts opening, Y should be zero, which I think for some stupid reason is, I can't remember if that's the top or the middle now. Let's just try it and see what happens. Might be going the wrong way around, but I can't remember what ridiculous coordinate system I made for that. So if I open it, yeah, it's the wrong way. So, zero is at the bottom and one is at the top, I guess. Um, this is very silly, okay. Um, I don't know, I don't know now. I really need to, in the header for where I set that up, <laughs> I should have said what the coordinate system is. I don't even know. So I'm doing the lazy thing of just fiddling. Wow, that's nice. Um, so what is going on here? So I guess one is up the top. And what was the bottom? I've already forgotten what that was doing. So if it's... This is starting it at zero and going to one. So zero is at the bottom and one for some reason is in the middle um maybe it is referring to the where the top of the console is um so what does it actually need to do not start at zero it needs to start from two that doesn't sound right does it and go to one um that feels wrong this feels very wrong so if i go times 2.0 So I, do I really want that? Do I want to start it at two and go to one? Maybe I do. Um, that seems kind of ridiculous. Um, why did I do it like that? I'm sure there was a very sensible reason. Ah, <sighs> okay. So I actually want Y to be like 2.0 minus the countdown. This is very silly looking, but okay. I think that makes sense for what I'm correct about the <laughs> coordinates. No, I'm not correct at all. Really not correct. Hmm. Really not correct. What did I do wrong there? Um, so my countdown opening should be starting at one and then going to zero. So when it first starts opening there, it should be where it normally is open. Yes, and then it's moving away. So it's going backwards, okay. Ah. Oh. Okay. Um, so two is outside of the screen. Okay. So it's starting at one and going to two. And we want it to start at two and go to one. This is getting worse and worse. Is that right? It's going, it should be going the opposite way, but the same. I think the values are right, but they're in the wrong order. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Animated. Perfect. That's opening. Now I want closing. And I think I can reuse the same stuff. Um, 
I'll probably speed it up eventually, but I'll need to come back and modify this bit I made a note about. So, um, it also needs to draw if it's closed. So I'm going to say um, if open or um, the countdown is greater than zero. Because I'm going to reuse that same variable for the closing, except it won't be in the open state. So. Uh, I'm going to rename that opening countdown to C animation countdown. Um, I could have made two variables in different states, but I don't know. This feels better. Um, okay, so if I'm now closing it instead of opening it, uh, otherwise, oh, you know what? It can always be one, can't it? When I change state, I can always reset it to one. That makes sense. Um, it just needs to go the opposite direction when it's closing. So I think right now, if I start closing it, it should do the opening animation again. Yes, now I want that one to go the opposite way. So, um, okay, I'm just going to split that out into its own thing. And I'm going to go equals. And there's two alternatives. This is if it's, um, so if we're opening, it should use that. Otherwise, it should use the one I had first, which is just this. Uh, I think that'll work. And I can get rid of that bit. And That. Why do a console over a menu? Um, a menu like a user menu. I wanted to do a console for because um, I liked the idea of typing stuff in and being able to grab one of my variables from my code without hooking it up to a button or something. So it's a little bit quicker to work with. So I have, I don't know if you saw yesterday, but I have a function to very easily make one of my variables appear in the console. Um, if you're using a game engine like Unity or Unreal, they already have all the facilities for doing that. And you can very easily hook it up to a panel that appears in the menu and have a little button or knob or a slider you can modify your variable with. Um, so it's the same kind of thing as that, except you're typing instead of using a widget, because I would have to then build the widget in the way I'm doing it. Um, but there's definitely an element of because Quake recreating the way they did it. Okay, that looks like it worked. So that is pretty much all I wanted to do with this. Um, yeah, I can also invoke functions from here. So I had a variable in here that I made just to make sure it was working yesterday that was like wireframe something or other so like a boolean that says hey do i want to render my chunks of the voxel world in a wireframe or not and just the chunks not everything and so what i did was i said okay register that variable give the address of it record what type it is and that's something i built into my console library and also give it a name and that's the name i'll use and i've just made it match my variable name but that is the name i will use to grab that from the console so i can grab that variable Auto-complete it, hit enter, it'll tell me the current value, hit up, repeat the last command, and if I go chunks wireframe one, I can change the value of the variable in my code. Um, so there you go. And it, it gives you a really easy way of modifying your program for really only for developer stuff. I wouldn't probably wouldn't use a, a console for user interaction or anything. That's just for me. So while I'm tinkering with things and I want to change variables without rebuilding the program and I don't really want to do the hot reloading thing for all my code um, because I'd like to work between operating systems and I don't want to do that in a different way for Linux and Windows but if you're stuck on one operating system absolutely that's a good plan and you wouldn't really need a console then um, 
but it, it lets you do stuff like that and really easily modify your program. Plus, I can actually call functions from here. So if I set up a function that does some fancy thing and reloads all my shaders, or um, I want to link a function to a key binding, I can also do that from a console. Um, so I can do functions and variables. And I copied this from Quake, and, but I think my one is better and more powerful than id software's one because in the early, I think Quake or Doom 3 or something, I was looking at the, the way they did this and I thought it was a really cool idea. Um, and they have these things called CVARs in id software land and it's exactly what I've just done there except they didn't figure out the type thing and they just made everything afloat because it simplified stuff. And I did that initially in the first version of this console thing when I was working on a terrain project before voxel stuff. I just coded this in, it was great fun. And there was a lot of, yeah, because Quake did it and I wanted to figure out how they did it um, and go through that same development process. But um, yeah, everything's afloat and it's kind of painful to use functions from it. And eventually you want something that isn't afloat. You want something that's a series of floats or a Boolean or a double or a specific data type. And yeah, float is interesting because you can cast it to just about everything and it retains validity. So if it's not zero, it's true, right? Um, and that's kind of neat, but I wanted to be a little bit more subtle with it. And it was really not hard to add in data types. Um, so I've got a list of those in here somewhere. Um, maybe I can go to the declaration. So it took me like two versions to come up with a nice way to do this. But um, when I register a variable from my code to access in the console, I could say specifically say this is a Boolean, an integer, an unsigned integer, a float, or some other custom thing. Um, and it's not hard to do that. Um, and you can go grab my console thing, see how I did it, if it's interesting for you. Um, and I also have a way of registering functions um, with a function pointer. So um, you can do interesting stuff there. Um, you could make it more interesting. I've just said only ever use a float because when I'm calling it from the console, and I did simplify that to a similar way that id software does these things. I don't think they even had functions in the first version, but um, the when you're giving a parameter, you can type in the function name and then space and then some variable. Um, so I could upgrade that so that you had different types of things, but for now, that's all I wanted to ever do with a function from the console. Um, easy to type it in then with a value. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. Sorry, I, I went on a bit there, but... um. Yeah, for me, that was kind of interesting. I always had things like, you know, key binding so that if I press the R button, it would reload all my shaders. So if I've got the shaders open in a text editor and I want to see what some new sign function does to some watery effect, I can instantly see what that does. Um, that's pretty cool. You can set that up so that you can automatically scan your file system for changes and automatically recompile but again that's system specific code and i don't like that stuff as a kind of a rule um i don't want to have branching you know six different operating systems way of doing that the only place i'll do that in a simple program is for timers um so i'll have maybe three versions of a accurate timer um yeah yeah anyway that's the console so it's like 50 percent because quake and then 50% because it's actually useful for experimenting with things. So I want to have things like the ability to call a function to reset all the terrain to flat or regenerate it with different parameters and tweak variables and stuff um, without having to close the program or do any fancy stuff with the, the way the code is built. Yeah, that's my console plan. Um, so I think it would look nice if it was faster to open and close. Um, so now I just have a time that's always one, but now I need to, I'm going to change that, but I'll, I want to factor it so it's always between zero and, and one when I do the arithmetic for the, how it affects the position. So, um, I think I had somewhere there like animation. Countdown? Okay. So I'm going to make it, let's make it a quarter of a second. So it's, um, I don't have any sounds plugged in, but it would be pretty neat if it played a sound as well for no good reason. Hello, forehead, uh, seers. <coughs> 
Um, okay, so now I want a super speedy console, but if I do that right now, it's going to do wacky stuff with the position, so I'll need to modify that. Yeah, it's not quite right. Um, so, what I need is to turn this into a factor. So, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I'm going to say float um, anim factor. Uh, and I'm going to say times four. So I could like make a constant or something up top rather than manually setting it. Um, that would probably save me a confusing bug later, but I'm not that smart, so I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> I'm just going to hard code it. Magic numbers all the way, yo. Um, so I'm going to use anim factor instead of this. So that should always then be between um, something like that. Um, I think that'll do. Has anyone on the chat actually made a drop down console before? I'm taking tips. Oh, that's so speedy. Isn't that speedy? Noob questions are absolutely allowed and encouraged. I don't have any sort of a plan. I'm just goofing around. So we can certainly chat about whatever you want. Okay, so all I really wanted was for a very, very fast console. Zippy dappy doo. Um, yeah, that feels good. I kind of like the blue color as well. I don't know why, but I think it's pretty neat. So I could try and improve the efficiency of it. It sounds like a lot of effort for something that isn't really going to improve anything of significance. <clears throat> um, yeah, I like that. So it'd be cool to set the fog distance from the console, right? So you could fiddle around with it. So that, I guess, is the next thing. Um, now I can't remember where the fog thing is encoded. It might be a shader thing. I think I have hard-coded the shaders in here, which is probably not ideal. Um, fog. Oh, God, yes, it is a hard-coded color. So I need to make that a uniform. Our new question is that, okay, so which one would you recommend, OpenGL or Direct3D for beginners? Um, some say OpenGL is not practical, bad API versus DirectX. Others say OpenGL is the best tutorials. Well, I've heard that too. Um, it's harder to learn Direct3D or vice versa. Um, so I'm confused. Uh, I want to begin some decent API to get fundamentals properly. Um, yeah, so I think both of them have kind of terrible tutorials and documentation and APIs. They're both terrible. So um, it's going to be a battle either way. Um, I go, I was, I've taught both. So I was teaching OpenGL at university, and I've also taught Direct3D 10, and I've recently taught Direct3D 11. Um, I find, I looking backwards, I felt like when I started teaching OpenGL, um, there was really nothing in terms of useful documentation that would appeal to a beginner. There used to be. For older OpenGL, there were online tutorials, which were great. There was um, NEHE, um, Neon Helium, or something like that, it was a website that had loads and loads of old school work through stuff. But that version of the API they were written for fell out of um wider circulation then newer versions work differently and shaders came in and it was all a bit redundant for people um so it became very very difficult to learn OpenGL for beginners and the official books are crazy town they are massive massive mega tomes and you end up with this like stack of these books that are all like this thick and you need like three of them and they cost like 60 to 80 bucks each um, just for learning the basics and people get overwhelmed and give up on it. Um, so what I did was started writing tutorials for my class to work through because I would get in labs where people were working on their assignments. The same kind of questions come up over and over and over again. We had like 200 students between 
uh, the class. So we had to split it up into groups. And I got really tired of answering the same question over and over again. So I was like, all right, this is crazy. Uh, what I really would be a more productive use of time is if I made like worksheets that were like, try this. And if this happens, try this. And there's some troubleshooting. And eventually I was like, all right, I'll just put all this stuff on my website. And people really liked it and um, turned that into a book of tutorials. So you can find that on the web if you want. Um, that's called, and I'll probably do a stream on how to get started with OpenGL um, over the next days. Um, but I will paste a link to my, if you want to see how I went with it, I've got at least the starter thing there for OpenGL. And I've recently written a Direct 3D starter, so for Direct 3D 11. So you can try both and see how you feel about them, um, if that's of any use to you. Um, I'm in this project using OpenGL. That's what I use most often. And the main reason for that, really the only reason for that, is because I like working on Linux computers more than the others. <clears throat> um, but I also have friends that use a variety of different computers. So if I want to build a version so it runs on a friend's Mac, uh, or a friend's Windows computer, you will get some version of OpenGL running on those too. So it's more portable. It's not instantly going to work. You're going to have to do some stuff that keeps each operating system happy. Um, but it's you're in a better setup. Otherwise, you really just have to use a game engine or do three versions of everything, which is horrible for one person to do. So yeah, I would not recommend the newer APIs. So Vulkan, Mantle, DirectX 12, I would steer well clear of that when you're learning. Um, at least go through some starter stuff from the other APIs to get an idea. Um, if nothing else, it gives you a hint of the time investment required. Um, and that it's going to, the time investment is a lot more for the newer APIs because they're not designed for beginners at all. And they, if you go to the Microsoft website for Direct3D, it will tell you that, hey, beginners do not use DirectX 12, use DirectX 11. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've got, uh, that, that should link you to some code as well if you want to look through some examples and things. <clears throat> um, I guess the caveats OpenGL, like, Try and use some version of OpenGL 4 if you can. Start with OpenGL 4.1 um, specifically. That should work on just about anything. That would run on most operating systems now. Um, it used to be fiddlier that like Mac would only run 3.2 and Windows would run maybe 3.3 depending on the graphics chip you had. And then, you know, it's kind of crazy. But um, these days, try OpenGL 4.1 specifically. Um, you will have to use shaders and just be really careful because a lot of the stuff online um, is out of date and will lead you down the wrong direction with older API stuff that isn't going to work very well anymore um, or not really compatible. And it's not clear at all that that's the case because OpenGL has got this whole backwards compatibility thing where it tries to let you use old conventions and things. So just be aware that that's a minefield. Um, so try and use only the new stuff if you can. Um, um, what else can I say about that? They're, I guess the main confusion is it has a state machine, a global state machine. It's not object-oriented programming at all. It's old school C. And um, it has binding and unbinding ideas so that when you're going to draw with something, you need to globally say, this is the shader I want to draw with. This is the texture I want to draw with. And this is the 3D mesh I want to draw with. And they're like, the one mesh you will draw with for all time from now onwards until you explicitly say, hey, OpenGL, draw with this new thing. So that's called a global state or a global binding model. And that is confusing as heck for most people. Um, the newer APIs don't do that because it's kind of really, really buggy and error prone. Um, I heard arguments that it was supposed to be more performant to do that with earlier drivers. I don't know. I think it was just a funny eccentric design, really. Um, so DirectX doesn't have that, but the newer versions of DirectX 11 and 12, um, you will fill out, every time you call a function to draw or do anything, you will fill out this gigantic struct with like a hundred different fields in it. Um, 10 fields, and some of those fields can be other structs, and you spend a lot of time filling out forms. It's like going to the doctor or going to apply for a driver's license every time you call a function. I find that unpleasant as well. Um, you don't have the state machine confusion, but you do have that. So I think people that try and build like, 
you know, maybe you learned C++ object-oriented programming in a class. If you try and replicate that way of building software with OpenGL, it gets really confusing. So if you're okay slowing yourself down and doing like old school C with large long functions where you can see the order of things, it's much easier to fix your problems if you code like that because you can see, oh, that thing was bound and I thought some other thing was and I encapsulated it and it was all wrong. Um, it's very easy to lose sight of what's happening in the global state model if you have little functions or little objects. So try and do big long functions for OpenGL, which is what I've got in this program here. Um, Direct3D doesn't mind. Um, you're not going to have that same problem. Um, yeah, I think that sums it up. But you're stuck on Windows, though. So if you want to work on other operating systems, good luck with that. <clears throat> I guess notable mention is also Apple's Metal API. And if you are a Mac person, that is probably your best low-level API to start with. It has something that is more familiar to people. So if you've done C++ or Java or Objective-C or Swift, you're going to find the way that functions and things are named in Apple's API more straightforward. They're more what you're used to. Big, long function names and things. Um, much more better documentation. It, it's the only one that's kind of not insane. Um, so people will say, hey, you don't have to make an unapproachable API just to make it faster. That's a terrible argument because look at Metal. It's actually pretty good to use. Then you're stuck on Mac, though. So that's your problem with that one. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll do a beginner stream. I don't have a fixed time. I think later today I want to do like programming, intro to programming part two this evening in three hours or so. Um, and then maybe tomorrow I'll do OpenGL I'll, um, intro. I'll definitely record it anyway. Um, I could do a direct 3D one. What would be really easy is uh, a WebGL intro, actually. So that's another API. Everyone can use it on every operating system. It'll run on your phone. It'll run everywhere. So WebGL is great. Um, if you want a really easy start to 3D coding, you can use, um, there's a framework called 3.js, very well designed. Um, so it's not like Unity, where it's easy to get started making stuff in 3D, but you have no idea how anything works underneath. You can really dig down and see how it's open source. You can see everything. And if you want to make OpenGL commands directly to the context, you can still do that. You can make your own shaders. But if you want the easy ride where, hey, just make it, give me a cube, make it run. I don't care about shaders yet. It will do that too. So it's got both levels of abstraction. It's fantastic. Um, that is a nice way to learn. And then if you want to do the real basics, you can go through. Mozilla has really great tutorials for onboarding basic WebGL, so it's a bit slower to get started then, of course. You're not going to be drawing 3D models of goblins and whatever from your games. Um, you'll start with triangles, but um, yeah, really, really, really good documentation. MDN, I think, Mozilla, Mozilla Developer Network. Um, highly recommend WebGL. And there's a free course, actually, um, on... I can't remember if it's Udacity or the other thing, one of those online learning courses. Um, run by Eric Haynes, um, which is spelled like that. And he is a phenomenal graphics programmer that's made loads of um, papers on all sorts of useful stuff. Uh, I think he works for Autodesk and Autodesk 360, which is an online architectural viewer. Um, I think he was instrumental on that. And they have a really fantastic free course teaching 3D graphics fundamentals for programming. Um, through videos and online tests and stuff like that, and um, you just need to sign up. I, I can't. I think it's Udacity, but I can't remember. Um, and yeah, they teach you all the fundamental ideas: gamma correction, shaders, textures, lighting, all the stuff you do, and other things. Way easier to get started. And if you want to, you can drill down and, and do all the low-level details too. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I, the problem with the other APIs that aren't WebGL is the setup takes forever. So just getting started with anything is a gigantic pain. And most of a stream I will do, like 90% of it will be how to get set up and link some helper libraries. You've got to use some libraries to help you get started um, with all of them. It is a pain. Um, whereas WebGL, just you just go two or three lines of JavaScript and you're started. You've skipped all of that uninteresting busy work, I want to call it. It has nothing to do with 3D graphics. 
It's just horrible, boring stuff you need to go through. So that's where most people get stuck, actually. But if you want to do low-level coding, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to see how game developers work, absolutely do C or C++. Um, but I wouldn't knock open uh, WebGL. It's got the same interface as OpenGL exactly, but uh, it's a cut down version based on the mobile version, OpenGL ES, embedded systems. Um, otherwise, exactly the same. So the same kind of OpenGL calls I make for a desktop, I can make on the web. Um, it's talking to the same graphics driver underneath. I think they sit on a couple of other stacks of graphics stuff. So um, you may actually end up be um, it, you've got an interface to OpenGL. I think on Windows it has a, even a layer where it translates that to direct 3D driver calls. So you're actually doing direct 3D on Windows, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, otherwise you get very much the same experience with less nonsense. <clears throat> same shaders. Um, and the kind of stuff I'm doing with the console, if you're doing that on the web, it's, you don't need to go through all this mess. Um, you can very easily modify your JavaScript while it's running to change the values of variables, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, so you don't need all this building of interactive things. You've already got a console in JavaScript. <coughs> um, yeah, that was pretty much all that I had planned for this little uh, coding session, so I don't know what to do next. Um, yeah, we could, I could just explain stuff if you're interested in <clears throat> little features of coding things. Um, yeah, because of that binding model with OpenGL, I have actually built some things to reduce the fluff. Um, I like to build a, a platform layer on APIs that I have to use. If I have to talk to a driver, I know I'm going to have to talk to eventually a different driver on a different operating system, and it is a pain. So I don't want any OpenGL specific code in my code, so I have it behind a layer. I'm usually not a fan of abstraction layers and wrappers and that kind of thing. People get carried away with that to a point it's not productive or helpful very easily. I went through a phase of doing that for sure, but this is one place where it's kind of helpful. So I have named my own commands and my own little it looks like a library it's just a little platform layer that says graphics start um graphics stop um draw stuff load an image into a texture and if i switch to direct 3d i will have the identical interface so my program no longer cares what driver abstraction it's talking to um which is all those things are they're not really a library they're more like a driver abstraction with someone's funny ideas about how that should work. Um, and I, I run out of patience with it, if I'm honest. So I have some things that make sense to me. Um, and they mostly are the same concepts of how you interact with things across uh, different APIs. So draw mesh is a kind of a fundamental concept. Um, and here's a bunch of stuff I want you to draw it with. And underneath, I have the OpenGL calls in here. So I could easily swap out this .c file with another one or have a macro that switches to some direct 3D code or a different version of OpenGL if I wanted to. <clears throat> um, and these are all actual OpenGL calls. So I just have a function called create buffer and then it does all the busy work of setting up buffers and textures and things. <clears throat> and then another Anton command where it does even more busy work. They, all this OpenGL error checking and stuff, I don't want that in my main code, so I will put that all together. I always want to do the error checking, but I don't always want that in my um, main program, so I'll put it in a behind a function that has a sensible sounding name. Um, yeah, most students try and do this, but they get really carried away, and it ends up getting in the way more often than not, so I think when you're starting, just put the OpenGL stuff in your code. But for me, at some point, it's like, I want a reusable thing, and I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times now, so I'm fairly confident that that's an okay way of abstracting it. <clears throat> um, yeah, does anyone have anything else they want to talk about before I make up another thing to randomly code?
yeah, I agree with Kevin there. Don't don't get carried away with writing abstraction layers until you've done a couple of APIs. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, what type of projects should you do after learning basic OpenGL for becoming a graphics programmer? Um, yeah, I've got two different ways of looking at that. So the last where you finish there is becoming a graphics programmer. And that makes me think of how do you get a job as a graphics programmer, which is kind of a different question. Um, so for building your skill base, I think you should always just make up the things that interest you. So find things that make a list, like an ambitious to-do list of little standalone projects you find interesting personally. So um, I think I can probably dig up one of my ones here. Um, so I was chatting one day with a guy at work, and I was like, hey, you know how in video games um, they often have that effect when you shoot a monster or something, and they just kind of disappear and disintegrate? They have this effect like they're dematerializing. Um, so let's try and see if we can figure out how to code that. And I'm just digging up a blog post here where I talked about that. So I just put that on my ambitious to-do list. We both had a go at doing it differently. Um, so I don't know if you can see that. Um, so this is one of the things, like a dissolve effect, I called it. And so this is done with a shader. Uh, I think I used WebGL. I think he, he had a go at doing it slightly differently. I can't remember how, 3JS maybe. Um, so I just have a, like a list of folders of demos of stuff I want to try. And this is just a really easy shader effect. And I did a bit of reading around and looked at how people might do it. Uh, and then just coded it and had a go and it looked I think really cool actually um, I didn't expect it to look that good and it was really simple so it turns out the way most people do these things is they just have an image of like uh, or a texture an image of uh, I just generated this in GIMP I think in the image program which is just give me a random clouds texture um, and then I loaded that in and you can see I've got like boxes on like um, a checkerboard that's the actual texture that the 3D model of the cube is textured with. But what I do is I also load this thing up. And I don't display it, but I do have that loaded in my shader. And then I run a timer and I send the time the same way as I did that animation for the console dropping down. I just have a factor between 0 and 1 for my time. Um, and as the timer elapses, what I do is compare the time to whatever the matching pixel is for that point of the surface. So normally I have um, a checker texture with like black, white, black, white. So in the top left corner where the black square is, it would correspond on this little image, which I'm not displaying, but I do have it available to look up what the matching pixels are. So for the top left of the face of the cube, I've got a black area there. And if that color value between zero and one is less than the time value, then I make it disappear. And if it's close to that value, I made it a little bit brown, so it looked like the edges were um, uh, burning away. So as the like timer was going between 0 and 1, eventually it all disappeared, but with different parts of the surface dif disappearing at different times because they have this like randomized cloud texture um, to compare to a timer. So that was really easy to do in a shader, um, and I got the code there somewhere. Um, yeah, so I have a list of stuff like that. Um, I have a repository on my GitHub, which I think I have over here somewhere, uh, where I basically, I try and do one or two things a week. Um, that is not it. Uh, it used to be called OpenGL Experiments, but now it's called Graphics Experiments because I had some stuff in there, the other one that was like the answers to assignments I said. So <laughs> I remade it with those things not in there. And like every week I'll try and do one or two little play around. Oh, I wonder how I can render um, just to a basic window in Linux without um, using OpenGL or anything. How do I make my own little software 3D renderer? Um, into a window. So I made a program to do that and I went and looked up how those things work. And then how do I start Vulkan? And so I made a little demo to start Vulkan and then after a week of playing around with that in the evenings I decided it wasn't for me. Um, and that actually was really useful to do because I was getting people at work asking me, hey should we switch to Vulkan for the API? And like once you can see the amount of developer time that we were never going to get the time to get any benefit from that. It was It's so hard when you're working in a job to justify any R&D time at all. For me, that was all the information I needed to say, you know what, that's, no, it's not going to work. Um, so here's, I got number 42 is my dissolve effect there, if you want to see the code for that. Um, I did it in JavaScript. 
And somewhere in here, so this is WebGL, and somewhere in here there is there's a bunch of matrix code um, for doing rotations and stuff for rotating the cube. But somewhere in here, the shader. Oh, it's in that HTML file. Uh, I think you could put it in a little script tag, so I probably did that. Yeah, I think that's it. That's all it is, actually. So if I zoom in on that, um, that is the whole shader the fragment shader, the per pixel stuff for doing that dissolve effect. And all it does is it takes in, I think height map is the name of that texture with the clouds and diffuse map is the one that's just the basic checkerboard. And it just says, okay, every frame, I'm, give me an update to what the current time is in the timer. And then um, somewhere down here, I'm actually gonna use that and say, okay, the difference between the where I am currently on, so this runs once per pixel, basically, of surface. And it says, okay, the texture I would be using if I was texturing myself with that cloud thing at this point is this color here. And if that value subtracting the current time is less than 0 0.1, is essentially zero, then make it disappear or color, the less than 0.1, I think that's where it colors the edges in a little burny color. So it's a kind of a, uh, reddy, greeny color. Um, but if it's zero, if it's almost zero, then discard it, so make it transparent. So that, like really easy to do, but it just like an interesting little side project. And I make a set of those things and I'm like, okay, that's I have a running to-do list I keep on Trello and I'm like, I'd love to find out how to do loading a BMP image. And I did that a few months ago. I'd never made a program to load a .BMP image. And I was like, I wonder how that works. Um, so I looked it up and I made a little BMP loader and I recently, I turned that into a little library because it ended up being actually a bit better than what some of the actual image loaders that are out there in libraries for loading images were. Um, and I had it in here actually, so it started here. Um, and I've now moved that because I made it into a little library. Um, so I got a few things like that that end up being quite useful for doing things later, text rendering, stuff like that. And I called it APG BMP. And it's over here, it's just two files, and that will load a BMP image for you. Um, and that ended up, last week, um, there's a Google partner project called Basis Universal that was like, yeah, we're gonna use it because it does what we want and it's been fuzzed. Um, so fuzzing was a new thing I played around with. And it has a nice license, so that got adopted, which is really cool. So, and that came out of a little play around graphics experiment. So, things like that, and that if they're actually interesting for people, they can help you build a little professional network, which is really important too. Um, you do have to talk about it. If you don't tell people about it, it's like it never happened. So, um, yeah, I think it, I'm kind of too lazy to blog things mostly, but I do my best. Um, I don't do my best. I'm way too lazy. Um, but keep practicing is where I was going with all of that because that can turn into things. Um, and like professionally, get involved in projects. So see if you can get an entry level job that is a, so like a research project in a university or a partner project or join a company that does some graphic stuff. Most likely you will not have something super important to do, but just being involved um, can get you a shoe into seeing how the processes work when they're applied professionally. And if you have start building up chunks of experience like that, it's much easier to get professional jobs. And if you have quite a significant chunk of that, you can justify doing independent work and consulting jobs. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I would say get involved, get experience, and the way to get experience is to keep practicing once a day or once once a week or something. Um, yeah, good question. WebGL sounds appealing for a beginner. Um, do you miss out a lot if you avoid modern APIs? Um, that is a very good question. The graphics programming side of things, if you want to do low level WebGL stuff, you can. So like what I did in that dissolve demo I showed you, that is almost identical to OpenGL programming and the concepts are all the same. You still have to do all the mathematics yourself. Um, I don't like using libraries for mathematics. I like the challenge of forcing myself to learn this stuff because I'm not a natural 
like mathematician. I was I didn't even do mathematics at school. I stopped doing it when I was 15 because I was convinced I was going to be an art student or something, which didn't happen at all. Um, so when I went to university, I had to learn all this stuff again. It was a disaster. Um, so I put quite a lot of time into making sure I can do these things myself. Um, and you can do it. And if you code it yourself, it's the easiest way to learn. So if you absolutely want to do low-level programming in WebGL, you can. I guarantee you can do that. Um, what you will miss more than anything else are the skills that aren't 3D graphics things. And that may be important to you if that's the direction you want to go in for a job. So I think it's a good idea to at least get some experience with starting a few different APIs so you get a, a broader concept of how these things work. But that's software engineering stuff. That's not necessarily um, 3D graphics skills. So you could take everything you learned in WebGL and take that to another API, API no problem at all. That will be transferable knowledge. Um, and you won't miss much. What you might miss is the very latest, newest extensions and things are usually not available in WebGL because it's a cut down version of the API. So if you want to play with compute shaders, you'd have to do that in one of the desktop APIs, at least now, maybe in a year that'll change. Um, what you will miss is the skills like linking libraries and using experience using the C or C++ or Swift programming languages or working in a larger team that works on a C++ code base. Um, you won't get that if you do WebGL. So it's good to get a few of these things that makes your, you, you more marketable yourself if you want to stay in graphics and work on different things. Try some of the game engines. Try working with and modifying Unreal um, once. <laughs> but that means that's probably enough to get one of those jobs. Um, you will definitely miss graphics fundamentals if you only work with Unity 3D. And that's something I have a little bit of a concern about across um, the AR VR hype at the moment. It's like I worked in AR VR um, professionally for a company that did this stuff. And most of my colleagues and peers now that are in that space are only using Unity 3D. And if you base your whole career on growing skills that are a product, that's a problem. So those are not transferable skills. So WebGL, you have a ton of transferable fundamentals, absolutely. Um, but if you're using an engine that everything is already available and actually prevents you from seeing how it works underneath because it's not open source, that is a little alarm bell for me. I think that's a risk. So a lot of students that like um, are currently learning games programming or whatever and they're only doing unity and they get jobs and you see job ads at the moment that are like unity engineer needs 10 years experience in unity not in 3d programming not in programming in unity which is a product made by a company um that is a risk so i would not put too many of your eggs in one basket like that that would be a bigger concern for me learning 3d stuff you will probably you, a lot of programmers i have worked with um that have only done unity have no idea how lighting works at all wouldn't be able to write a shader at all. And that is not a hard thing to do, but it's a fundamental skill. And if you've got that knowledge, you understand better how to optimize things, what the actual workflow underneath is, how the driver is talking to the CPU. So you will still get that in WebGL, but I'd be very wary of only ever using a game engine to jump ahead. Um, it's, it's a good idea to get some experience with all the popular ones, because there will be jobs there you can take. But um, I think the bigger trap is that most most of the industry follows products um, and bases their skills on products. And I think that's a bigger problem. <clears throat> it's the same thing for artists and designers who are wedded to a particular Autodesk product. You cannot trust these companies at all. They are volatile. They will cancel products at a moment's notice if it doesn't make their projection look good. Um, the licensing fees can increase. Your career is then pinned on having a license for something. And you see designers complain about this all the time when their employer stops paying a license for Photoshop or whatever it is, <clears throat> whatever design tool that they depend on. So I, I think having transferable knowledge skills like that's really important. <clears throat> That was quite an extensive rant, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, would you recommend writing a software renderer? That's a really good question, to understand graphics concepts before diving into APIs. Yes, I would. And I did that with my last class, actually. So um, what I did as a warm-up, we were doing DirectX 11, but what I did as a warm-up 
was um, part of the existing class was to make a ray tracer first. I highly, highly recommend that. But even before that, um, do an exercise to just write out an image. So see if you can write a TGA image. Look up the spec for that. It's the easiest image format that will open directly in any image viewer. Um, there's an even simpler image format called PPM, um, which you can use. And that's great, but like for some reason, image viewers don't all recognize it. You'd have to open it in GIMP or something. I mean, that's okay. You could, there are websites that will open it if you drag it on. Um, that's e really easy, and you can even do a text version of that. It's like an ASCII text file. I think it's P3 is the format name for that. Look that up. Make sure that you can write out an image. If you can do that, you start really cementing that understanding of graphics and the basic programming concepts behind it at the byte level. So do that. See if you can do a binary image file like TGA. Um, not hard to do. I have a little crappy TGA um, reader writer here if you want to reference. Uh, Peter Shirley's book is fantastic. So he's got um, these mini book series, um, learning ray tracing in one weekend. That is the best way to start with computer graphics currently available at all. So if you could do any C programming or any programming and don't mind converting it a bit, it's like very simple C++ style, but they are the ultimate best way to start with graphics. You won't be starting with the kind of graphics 3D games use yet, but it is absolutely a fundamental paradigm for rendering, and that is ray tracing um, or path tracing. Some people prefer to call those things, but um, yeah, that's the best way to start. Absolutely work through Peter Shirley's book. <clears throat> Um, let's see if I can dig that up there, but they, they're fantastic. I think they might be free now. Um, yeah, so I just Googled that and the real time rendering book, which is a different textbook. Um, had a link to it, and it seems that it's the whole text and looks like it's free. So he tells you how to write out an image in the first chapter, and that is the best way to start getting into graphics and programming in general. I will probably do that in part three of Intro to Programming. Um, I think that's really, really nice exercise because it gets you thinking about memory, arrays, loops, um, file input, output, and it, you get to see something at the end. So when most people are learning programming, it's all just like printf stuff, which is super boring. And it turns a lot of people off. But if you've got an image and you can start going, hey, you know what you should do is an add-on exercise to see if you can generate an interesting pattern or draw a line on it or, you know, from XY to XY. Um, oh, this is an old version. This is one on GitHub. Okay, so there are free versions available. But anyway, this is a fantastic way to start. That's all the code you need to write out an image, build interesting patterns. I like really, from my point of view, that's an ideal way to code um, or start getting into graphics. Um, if you can't write out an image that like and start doing 3D stuff, there's like a, definitely a piece of information missing there that'll bite you later. Because um, you do need to know this stuff when you load images into use as textures. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so Kevin's just pasted in the URL there. Just put it in there. Cool. Oh, wow. Okay. This is a whole GitHub page and everything. Um, HTML page. That's neat. This is absolutely the ultimate way to do get into graphics. So once you've got a feel for that and you've made a software renderer for ray tracing, you can very easily make a software renderer for rasterization as well, which is the the kind of stuff I'm doing in my demo there, which is your typical 3D games rendering. And you can do that in software, and it's just as easy to get started. Um, so you'll probably start off with drawing a triangle. Um, I might have some I might have some resources for doing that too, but if you're interested, just hit me up and I'll, I'll see what I've got um, in terms of examples and tutorials and stuff. I might have something. I definitely did this. So I made for my last class, um, we loaded an image, did some ray tracing, and then I showed them, um, and I had code and everything, so I probably got it somewhere. Um, a starter that's like, hey, by the way, rasterization is just as easy to do. If you can spit out an image for ray tracing, you can do the same thing um, for rasterized graphics. And you have slightly different algorithms for drawing, but it's not hard. And here's a triangle, and here's some mathematics you can code in to make it rotate around. Uh, you can animate stuff, and here's how you do lighting, and here's how you load a 3D model from a file and display it. So 
I had that kind of stuff to show people. I think that's quite inspiring because the funny thing is, if you do this stuff yourself in software, it's easier to do this than it is to even start an API for <laughs> using the graphics card for OpenGL or Direct3D. It's crazy. Um, so uh, I would absolutely criticize the design of modern graphics APIs. I don't think they're very good. Um, I, my personal view is I think they've misunderstood the importance of um, there are like some design principles of an interface in general. It's like making it easy to learn, easy to understand, easy to get started with your simple stuff, but then also easy to drill down. So I, I am heavily critical of the direction that um, these consortiums and companies have taken with the design of APIs these days. I just think they're bad. Um, and they get very defensive about it um, and say that, no, it has to be that way because industry and all you junior people can go use Unity. I, I think that's not the right attitude. So I don't mind being critical of that or them. Um, but uh, yeah, I would highly recommend what I think is a good API is um, in that sense is 3JS because it does both those things. Um, a simple interface, get started right away lots of resources, nice community, and you can drill down and do the specific stuff if you want to. So it is possible to make a nice API. <clears throat> um, yep, definitely do both. Um, okay, so I might have to dig around later. I don't know where all the stuff is. I might have some slides and stuff for getting started with rasterization, <clears throat> but I will, I will definitely look at that. In fact, make myself a to-do list note. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try and put it on my like little blog. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about, or if we can, uh, if you, if that's about it for today. <clears throat> I've never heard of Raylib. Um, <clears throat> Kevin mentions that similar to 3JS. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't seen it before. Raylib.com, he's saying. Um, that looks pretty neat. Yeah, so you could have a play around with that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, there's some great questions there, though. Seriously. Um, Doing it yourself in software, brilliant, definitely a brilliant idea. Even if it's just like half an hour or an hour that you spend getting the basic ideas there to draw a triangle or a line, um, that's that would give you a lot of insights that you would skip otherwise. That it will help you for sure. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I think I kind of I've kind of done everything I wanted to do in my little play around coding session. I had a to do list to do next on stream. Regenerate the terrain with the console. Save and load to and from file from the console. Frustum culling I forgot about. Slice view. XOR shift for rant. There was something else I was talking about today. Oh, maybe the fog. I totally forgot about that. Control fog distance from console, um, and that needs a shader uniform. So I have a shader, which is a little mini program that runs on the GPU that says how to render the terrain. Uh, and it currently says, if you're this far away from the camera, you're in fog. And what I need to do is have that value controllable from the CPU where my main program is running. So I can say, hey, GPU, change that value that you had to what I want that I've just typed into my console. So. Um, in order to do that, there is uh, the different APIs have different facilities for sending variables across. Um, but there's a thing in OpenGL called a uniform. Um, I've already forgotten what the DirectX equivalent is. Um, constants or something they call them. It's it's already dropped out of my short-term memory, so there you go. But um, <clears throat> yeah, no, it's gone. <laughs> Um, so I would then have two copies of the variable, one in my C program and one in the shaders. And when I set the variable in the console, I'd say, hey, 
you know, change my fog distance. Um, and then after I change it, I need to know to update that value so that the GPU or the shaders version of that also updates to respect that. Um, I think I lost my, there we go. So in my main thing, um, until I find a better place for it, I can just put this up here somewhere. Um, static um, float uh, fog distance. Um, yeah, I don't know what the default is. Um, I had that open here somewhere. So fog color, fog factor. Okay, so I can just have another fog factor I send in that multiplies this between zero and one. So this is presumably already a value between zero and one it is. So I can just multiply that by another value between zero and zero and one. Um, so another factor, um, call it 1.0 by default. And then what I'll do is register that for my console um, where did I do the other console stuff? Con <laughs> uh, I'm great at naming comments. Um, the funny thing is, like, I'm I'm naming these comments not for other people, but for me, so that when I go search and I go, where did I put console stuff? <laughs> it pops up with console stuff. Um, that would not be how I would work on a shared code base. Um. Uh, register variable, and I want to call it the same thing as the variable name, maybe without the prefix. Um, and it was a float, right? Okay, I think that should work. Um, Fog disinfect. Yeah, so okay, I've set that up. So all I need to do now is hook that up to my shader. Um, I wonder, maybe I can do that quickly, in fact. Um, I think I have a bunch of shader variables already in here, so I can add a new one. I just make up some commonly used variables that all my shaders have. Um, Um, okay. And I'll set that to some default value. So if I name the variable in my shader with the same name, I should be able to access it now from my C program. Um, this is just a bunch of like helper code I wrote to make things easier because I'm lazy. Um, to speed up my development time. Um, okay, so I need a new uniform. Uniform, and it's a float, and it's called that. So this is, a, a, you, normally, if, if you were a sensible person, you could write, um, which I am not, obviously, you could, this is a shader program, and it's just like, it looks like a C program, and it's literally, see, it even has a main and everything. Um, you could write this in a plain text file and call it dot, frag or something, .glsl, whatever you want. So it looks like C code in its own file. But I have not done that. I've put it all into a string, which is why I have all this tedious quotes and slash ends and everything, because I was literally too lazy to drag around a bunch of files with this. Um, it has now made it easier to port to a new folder and start a new project, but ultimately this is going to get on my nerves to modify, because I will forget a semicolon or a closing quote somewhere and wreck it. <clears throat> Um, yeah, it can, it can be nice, uh, but, uh, I will screw it up at some point. Um, and I will throw my toys. They will be thrown. Um, okay. So what I need to do, I have fog factor. I think if I just multiply this value by my uniform, it should, well, that should work. Now it should default to a very value of zero. So there should be no fog anywhere if I run it now. And I just need to do the hooking up in my C program. So I send the value I want. Okay, okay, so there's no fog, that's perfect. Okay, so it's working. 
as intended, which just never happens when I'm streaming stuff, so this is good. Um, now what I need to do is say, when I draw the chunks, which I've already forgotten where that is, um, chunks draw, what a well-named function, once again, okay. Um, so I have a graphics function. I, I went through yesterday and all of these files, I gave them a nice prefix so I could separate them out into little moduli things. So I'm not, I'm using C. If you're using C++, you could have a namespace uh, or a, a class name or something. But I'm not, so I'm just prefixing things to try and keep them clear which one belongs in which file. Cause I might split some of these out into libraries later, which I like doing. I have a whole set of those things that have been like that. So I think what I want more from this project than making a game onto it is like, hey, are there some cool things that I build in here that I could reuse in little libraries somewhere for other projects? Um, so I've tried to tidy it up a bit yesterday. Um, I would like to be able to take this graphics layer and reuse it. It was a bit of a mess before. So I have a thing here for uniforms, I think. So this is the one I want, because it's a single float I'm updating. Um, oh, I see, I need to get hold of that shader. And I'm not sure if I've exposed that in a sensible way. Probably not, probably not. Um, no, I haven't. Um, I don't, I see, I could include the console header in here. Um, at the moment, only main knows about my console. I could do it like that. Uh, what's the easiest way to do this? Or I could say, hey, Voxel's giving you a shader. Um, but it doesn't have the graphic stuff in the API, so. Or I could add another function here that's like, okay, let's just do that. Um, void chunks update fog distance, or just fog distance. Something like that. Maybe this is the least painful way of doing this so I don't mix and match too many files or create inter interdependencies because I might want to shuffle it around later. Um, uh, I, in general, don't like to have functions that just call functions, um, but there you go. I think it'll be an acceptable sacrifice at this point. Um, doom, doom, doom. What was the name of that shader? feel like voxel shader is the one in question. Um, and the location was, okay. Voxel shader dot u fog factor. Yes. Yes. This looks like it's gonna work. Um, okay. And draw. So I, it's probably okay to update that every frame. Missing something. Fox two fifty-five. Oh, I'm still screwing that up. Uh, I had fog factor or something, right? Oh no! What did I call it? So probably eventually I just expose the console as a shared header everywhere, so I could do all of this stuff and not have these variables in main at all. Um, I have no idea why C complains about uh, not having a new line at the end of file, but it's very annoying. <clears throat> it seems completely ridiculous to me, but there you go. Okay, okay, okay. So, what if I change it to like two? Ooh, that worked, didn't it? The fog distance factor 100. Look at that. That did something crazy. So I've oversaturated the colors there for... <laughs> Perfect. Um, wow, that's interesting. So the, because of the way the mathematics are done with colors, it's oversaturating it if it goes over a certain factor. That's fantastic. Yeah, interesting. I like it. I like it. Um, so it must be doing a subtraction of colors, perhaps, and then 
if it goes over one, it makes the other, it makes, it actually subtracts blue, something like that. Um, I don't know, but it's pretty cool. So I can now fiddle with the fog factor with the console until I find something pleasing. Um, and that may just be like matching it up to the distance things disappear at. So now it's kind of obvious and the distance things are like popping in and out. So the reason I had fog initially was to mask that. And like here I have a nice level of precision to tweak it until I find something cool. So it looks like where I had it was probably about right. But um, yeah, that's why I want to have a nice interactive console. It's easier to do that stuff without like recompiling things. <clears throat> cool. I think that's all I wanted to do. So unless you guys have got any um, other chat, I might take a break, but I'll come back in like... What time is it now? 3.30. So I, I think I said it's 6 o'clock. I would do part two of how to do programming with C. Um, doing, I think, functions and variables will be enough. Um, and I'll do that in like two and a half hours. How big is the world? That is a good question. Um, I think the way I did it was there are 16 chunks across, I think. I can double check. I think there's like 16 across and 16 down. And then each chunk is like 16 by 16 blocks and then up to 255 high. I think that's, and that fit nicely in memory. So if you make it bigger than that, you have to be cleverer um, about how you set things up in, in arrays and lists and numbers. Um, yeah. So this is way bigger than I would actually need for my little strategy game idea. Um, you could you could extend it, of course, because of the way the noise functions work. I've just made it match up to my like image dimensions. But because they're kind of wrapping, you could easily do the Minecraft Infinite Worlds thing with another little play around demo is how I would do that. I'd try it out um, and see how that looked. And if it worked, I'd bring it in. Um, I don't have an infinite voxel world at the moment. Um, it would it would require a different way of representing chunks and locations. So at the moment, the main limitation I think is actually the way I do color picking. So I think I can only fit in 16 by 16 chunks with 16 by 16 by 255 um, uh, sizes of chunk, and then six faces on each thing to do the like picking a particular face, and it resolves that into which chunk and which voxel and which face based on a unique color and I have a limited number of colors. So like 256 colors and four channels. So it's split up nicely there. What I would need to do with a bigger world is say, okay, every time we move the camera so that you're in a new chunk, only the, you know, whatever, 16 by 16 chunks closest to you are considered for the color picking. And the other ones we're gonna ignore. That would be, I would have to do that. Um, so that you have some radius of things you cared about clicking on. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of all it does at the moment, so. Um, a cool thing that I did on this demo was um, I was going to do paging like Minecraft where they came in and out of disk, but I actually didn't need to do that in the end. Um, it loaded pretty quickly for the whole lot that I cared about. Um, but what I did do was there's a newer feature in OpenGL, well, okay, so 10 years new, um, called Texture Arrays. And then previously, I had been using older versions of OpenGL for maximum compatibility across systems. Uh, these days, not a big issue. I think you can assume 4.1 everywhere or, you know, or otherwise you're not supported. I think that's the best way to go these days. But that means you have now have access to texture arrays. So before you needed to do like Sprite Atlas style stuff and pack every one of the little tile images you want into one big image and then pull them out and then make sure they don't go over the edges of the other images when some of the mip mapping and stuff kicks in and you get bleed. It's horrible. It's a real pain to work it out. And you need to make a like command line tool to build your Atlas image out of the individual images and add in all the boundaries and stuff. It's painful. So with, um, array textures you don't need to do that anymore it is so much nicer so for this all i did is i just feed it I'm, i make one big texture and i'm like all right 
I'm going to give you this many layers, and there are the individual little tiles I'm going to use. Um, so you no longer need to worry about bleed, ruining the edges of the images, or any of that kind of stuff. So it, if you don't care for that as, as things get further away in the distance and mapping, mapping kicks in, you will see the edges of the tiles next door will start to bleed into the images of distant things. It's really annoying. Um, and you get little lines appear and flicker as you move around. It's horrible. So tile, anyone who's done a tile-based environment's run into this stuff. So texture race, you don't need to worry about that anymore. You just say when you're drawing which number from the series you want it to texture with. That's it. And it's pretty cool. I think the only limitation, limit, only limitation was that you have a limited number of layers you can put into any one image. But that's not a big deal. It fit more than enough that I want to work with in this demo. <clears throat> Okay, I, th I think I'll uh, I'll finish there um, and have a bit of a break in a, some kind of a fitness break so I don't go insane. <clears throat> but I'll be I'll be coding. I, this wasn't a planned stream. I was just like I want to play around, so I may as well stream it and chat to people. So I will be available for further such streaming stuff in the future. I think I put my rough schedule. I didn't even put it in the description. I have a blog post. Um, I will try and link it to that Twitch page. What are you doing? This is the least useful stuff to have in the explanation of the stream. Um, okay. What are you doing? Who are you? That's not really important. Uh, where are we? Oh, I do have it. I do have a link there. I don't know why it doesn't come up as a link, but okay. Oh, it's Markdown. Oh, how do you do Markdown links again? It's like square bracket, square, square bracket, round bracket. Let's try that. Oh, it did work. It worked. Ha ha. I remembered. Markdown is horrible. <laughs> for links and stuff, I never remember the order for the formatting. <clears throat> Okay, I will catch you guys later. I might see you later if you're interested in some basic programming stuff. But I'll jump on chat after this. How do I turn off OBS again? Okay. <clears throat>